the second Watershed Stewards Academy class. This week, we're focusing on green infrastructure. So we're gonna have a couple different activities to really dive deeply into this. Um, we have Brian McKnight, who works with AWS, um, and Kendra Heisen, who works with MNC PPC and also Urban Design Studios. And they're gonna tell us a little bit about green infrastructure, low impact development, and then we'll get to actually see some projects on Tuesday, um, take a walking tour, and then next Saturday, you'll have the opportunity to uh, get your hands dirty uh, with a project at Fairmont Heights. So with that, I'd like to kick it off um, to our two speakers. Feel free to introduce yourselves and anything you'd like to share to open. Hi, I'm Brian McKnight, um, and I'm the Green Infrastructure Specialist at Anacostia Watershed Society. Hello, everyone. I'm Kendra Heisen. I am a senior planner with the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission in Prince George's County, and I am the co-founder and current board president of the Urban Studio, uh, a nonprofit that's focused on teaching communities of color how to design for their own futures. Um, and I'm excited to be here with you all today. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so to do a little bit of level setting, let's first talk about what is green infrastructure? How can we use it? And then let's dive into some specific projects that's gonna help inform our tour. So um, for those of you who are unfamiliar, low impact development refers to a system um, or systems and practices that use, the, use or mimic natural processes that result in the infiltration, evapotranspiration and use of stormwater um, in order to protect water quality and associated aquatic habitats. So we have like five core requirements for low impact development, which is one, to conserve natural areas and minimize paving. Two, we wanna minimize development impact on how water flows in and around our site. Three, we wanna maintain water runoff rate and duration from the site, meaning we wanna slow the water down essentially. We don't want to, overburden our storm systems or sewer systems too quickly. Um, four, we scatter different integrated management practices throughout the site. Um, they help to store and evaporate and drain and infiltrate water. So that means we want to make sure that along our, the totality of our property or our site, we wanna have multiple areas where we are attempting to slow down or treat water. And that could be something as simple as, um, having a planted area of shrubs, or even you know, your vegetable garden could essentially be a way to slow the water down. And then five, we wanna design and implement pollu uh, pollution prevention, maintenance and public education programs. So through low impact development, we wanna make sure people understand what we're trying to achieve and understand that um, through the implementation of things like best management practices and stormwater systems that we can maintain um, a healthier environment and we want to get the public involved so that they can also be stewards for this type of uh, development. I'm going to go to my next slide and excuse me if you guys are just getting my best side today. I just I'm sort of looking at my other screen. Um, so what is green infrastructure and green infrastructure is a part of low impact development. So low impact development is sort of the totality of how we look at a project site or a property and think about where we're going to do interventions and we wanna do them in a sustainable way. So that's sort of how low impact development is this all encompassing idea. But green infrastructure is specifically the, um, the approach to water management and the processes that we use to restore water quality and mimic natural processes. So um, green infrastructure may be something like your rain garden or a bioswale or something that was specifically um, designed and engineered to manage water runoff in a um, positive way. So why does this matter? And you all can read this, but I'm gonna read it too. Green infrastructure incorporates both the natural environment and engineered systems to provide clean water, conserve ecosystem values and function and provide a wide array of benefits to people and wildlife. Green infrastructure solutions can be applied on different scales from the house or building level 
to broader, larger landscapes. So you might have gone to places like, I'm trying to think of a place that everyone might know. I know one of my favorite green infrastructure sites is Canal Park at the Navy Yard where the little ice skating rink is. And I don't know if you all have been there, but that is like a really great example of, you know, uh, green infrastructure on a landscape level where they're collecting lots and lots of water from the surrounding buildings and the streets and they're using it for a recreational purpose like an ice skating rink or a water fountain. So um, green infrastructure can really have both an impact on the environment but also can serve some recreational needs as well as helping us to water our plants. Um, and you all can stop me anytime if you think I'm going too fast or doing too much, but um, there, there are five types of green infrastructure that I think we typically see most often in our urban environments. And those are street trees. Um, we see rainwater harvesting, which are things like rain barrels or cisterns, bioretention, which are um, kind of those, when you see like a tree pit on the side of the road, that's kind of a little bit deeper than you would think a tree pit should be. Most oftentimes that's bioretention and that's a way to capture water and treat it before it enters back into the hydrological system. And then you have permeable pavement, which can be brick or concrete or permeable asphalt. My favorite's flexi pave, um, but that's because you can do a whole lot of cool stuff with that. And then we have green roofs. So like I said, we have um, some five types of green infrastructure. These aren't the only types of green infrastructure, but these are the most common you'll probably see in your community or in urban environments. And these are sort of the most applicable to your own individual property or um, smaller sites. Uh, you can do some really cool things with green infrastructure. Like I mentioned before, you can create you know, ice skating rinks and fountains, but I think we're really focused on the neighborhood scale and what you can do on your own property um, or can encourage your neighbors to do. So street trees. Um, street trees are a great form of green infrastructure. Uh, apparently there are approximately 150,000 street trees located along the streets of the District of Columbia. Um, and what trees tend to do, and when we say street trees, we really mean we can plant ornamental, what I call ornamental trees or what anyone would call ornamental trees like a cherry blossom or a red bud. Um, cherry blossoms are not native, but red buds are. Um, they're smaller trees with a smaller canopy size. Their canopy is gonna be between 35 and 40 feet. But for street trees, we really want some substantial, some big guys, we want some really tall, widespread trees to not only offer that large canopy to capture water when it rains and slow water down, but to also help the soil systems beneath the ground. And they also provide a significant amount of shade and lots and lots of wildlife habitat. Yeah, they can help reduce that heat island effect, cool, the, cool some of these hot surfaces. So street trees are really great. Um, I think this picture, these sort of look like ash trees, which might be a no-go here. But I always recommend a nice red maple or some northern oaks or uh, elms are pretty good. Or what is it? The Jeffersonian elm is pretty yeah. popular around here. Yeah, there's, we, there have been some issues with Dutch elm disease, uh, but mm. there are some really good new cultivars, um, Jefferson and, and um, Princeton elms are resistant to Dutch yeah. elm disease. And they get, they have a nice tall kind of, yeah, that, not quite a martini glass. But yeah, almost they an have umbrella. A, or, yeah, an yeah, umbrella type. Really uh, great for, for street settings. They're, they're in uh, Central Park. Exactly. Yep. And so one of the next uh, forms of green infrastructure we have is bioretention. And um, you all might be familiar with this site. This is right in front of the Department of Energy and Environment on First Street in Northwest. Um, and they've done a really great job in front of this site, kind of taking almost a very long, large portion of the sidewalk to capture stormwater, not only from the building and the sidewalks, but from the roads as well. Um, bioretention are systems that capture and store stormwater runoff and pass it through a filtered bed of engineered soil media 
composed typically of sand, soil, and organic matter. And so rain gardens are a common example of bioretention, um, but they're a little less of an engineered example of bioretention. This is the one you're seeing in this picture is very heavily engineered. Um, so there's lots of drainage happening, but you can still accomplish something like this on your own property with very um, simple uh, engineering and, and grading changes to your site. And so, and you want to, and it also offers offers opportunity for wildlife as well as um, little respites. Uh, this is not typical in the rest of DC, but I think DC is sort of moving in that direction where they're giving us these 150 foot setbacks from the road. So most buildings will be set back pretty far so that they can accommodate for these types of things or outdoor seating and things like that. Yeah, one thing to think about for sure um, with, with the, especially with these urban uh, green infrastructure projects is that, you know, with urban sites, they're typically pretty constrained and space is a big factor with determining which, which types of BMP can work. Um, and, you know, this is a, a good example um, where there is the space uh, to do a larger rain garden project, but, you know, in some of these smaller sites, you, you do have to rely on, on things like trees or, or some of the other, you know, rain barrels that we'll look at in a little bit um, to, to fit into tight spaces. Yeah, thank you both. I also want to just highlight the point that this is sort of an exemplar uh, sample of what a bioretention can yeah. be. Uh, this is sort of, you know, if I put put everything from the bioretention idea box into, into a thing and jumbled it up and put it in the same project, that would be this. If you yeah. did something like this for your capstone, it would not need to be this sophisticated or complicated or require this much engineering um, in order to, right. you could do something more simple for your project um, that could be accomplished uh, more cheaply um, and with with the skills that you'll learn in this class. But it's a, yeah. it, it's a great precedent. And, um, you know, a lot of the plants uh, could work really well in another setting. Um, you know, it's, they're really specific, there's a really specific plant palette that you want to use for rain gardens. They have to be able to tolerate that, that really, you know, those wet soils, be able to sit in standing water, which not every plant can do. But then they also have to be able to handle drought conditions because rain gardens are, aren't always wet. Um, if you get three weeks without rain, uh, the, the rain garden is going to be completely dry and the plants need to be able to survive in that condition as well. Um, but then, you know, we're also looking for those native plants um, that can, um, you know, can support uh, habitat and, you know, or the local, uh, local fauna. Um, and, uh, and yeah, plants that are good at um, break, that can also handle some urban pollutants. Um, you know, you get and foot salt traffic. runoff <laughs> and foot, yeah, that's right, really durable plants that can handle dogs walking on them and pooping yeah. on them. And <laughs> you, can, you can edit that out if you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I forgot to mention uh that i am also a trained landscape architect so that's the sort of where i get a lot of my knowledge from i feel like people probably were wondering like how does she know this stuff and like, oh i have the training in this and one of the things i was going to say is that if you're doing a capstone and you're thinking about bioretention you always want to um when uh, as a designer I, I typically think about circulation a lot and that's not just circulation of people but it's also circulation of water and and mm -hmm. um, you know animals, and so when you think about the circulation of water on your site and where it's going, that's sort of you, you kind of bioretention is this way to sort of take your water through this really cool journey across the mm -hmm. site that allows it to be cleaned and, and and really serve a positive function for the rest of the the site. So just think about that circulation path of your water and and where those infiltration um, sites can happen. Thank you. So we have um, another form of green infrastructure that you'll see commonly is rainwater harvesting. Uh, rainwater harvesting is the process of collecting rainwater from impervious surfaces for future use. And harvested rainwater is often used for irrigation and other non-potable purposes, such as for use as, as uh, cooling towers or toilets and things of that nature. So you'll typically see rain barrels or cisterns 
or um, um, these, and those are typically capturing water from either downspouts that are connected to your roof. So you're taking the runoff from that impervious surface and funneling it into a rain barrel for later use or, um, or for future use of like watering your plants and things like that. Um, I think we get quite a few questions about mosquitoes with regards to rain barrels and things like that, but there are some um, mechanics within the cisterns that help to prevent that uh, in some instances, but I will say that um, be careful with your, your outpour, your outlets for your storm drains because they can be a little nesting area, especially those uh, ser serrated black ones. They tend to capture little pools of water that are just perfect for mosquitoes to breed. Um, um, another great benefit of, of the rain barrels is um, it's, it's water that you don't have to um, add to your utility bill. Um, so instead of, you know, using the hose and having that on and, you know, running up a tab, um, you can, you know, it's a, it's a free source of water and, and actually the water is uh, better for plants than the water from your hose. Um, you know, your, the water that comes through your, um, through your system in your house is treated with things like fluoride and other chemicals to make it better for humans and safer for us to drink. But, um, but you know, those, those chemicals aren't necessarily, uh, they can be pretty harsh to plants. Um, and so this, this water in, in rain barrels is, is really good for them. Yeah, exactly. So thanks for that, Brian. I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next thing which is permeable pavement. So permeable pavement or pervious pavers allows water to seep um, around and through paved surfaces and soak naturally into the ground. It is a self-draining system constructed, constructed with various layers of gravel, rock, and a filtering layer or infiltration um, system. And so you'll typically see in this picture, these bricks are uh, permeable paving, but there's also a tree grate here. And these little spaces in between the bricks are where the water is allowed to infiltrate. Um, and typically in permeable paving systems, there's um, a couple of layers that are happening underneath of the ground, right? So you have your initial layer that most people might be walking on, which could be a permeable concrete or a permeable asphalt. But the under layers are also very important because you wanna make sure that your water is fully infiltrating and you don't get pools of water just sort of sitting on top of your permeable paving systems. So uh, I think standard is to dig down, I think maybe 18 inches or so. Um, that could be ambitious. I don't think that's ambitious. I sort of think you should go maybe 24, <laughs> but that's just my personal perspective. And those between the, the top layer and the sub layers, there's a lot of different sizes of um, material or aggregate, what you would call it, that helps to filter the water and then return it back into the, the natural soils. So these can be, um, it, it, permeable paving is really difficult for parking lots sometimes because of the weight of cars and things like that. But for a walking surface that people are just gonna be walking on, it's really um, a really great opportunity to just slow that water down and allow it to really infiltrate into the soil underneath. Yeah, and so basically the, the thing that makes it permeable is the joint space um, in between each paver. Um, the pavers themselves are not permeable. Um, and yeah, exactly like Kendra was talking about that you essentially have a reservoir underneath those pavers. Um, and so there's gravel that's pretty large, maybe an inch, uh, three quarter inch or so um, pieces of gravel. And it's that space that's in between the gravel that has that capacity to, to hold water. Um, so you get this big reservoir underneath um, that's yeah, either going to uh, infiltrate slowly into the into the soil there, um, or you know sometimes they have to be lined, but they're also, and and um, you know with with an underdrain, but they'll still um, slowly 
uh, drain back into the system, which is really important. Um, you know, in big rainstorms, you just want to slow the water down as much as possible so that you're not overwhelming um, like the combined sewer system. Um, and an awesome benefit of permeable pavers is um, in in the winter when the water's running through those joints, you don't have ice anymore because um, when the water is not collecting on the on the surface, it doesn't have the opportunity to freeze. And so it's actually can be a, a type of surface that eliminates the, the risk of ice, uh, which is pretty awesome. Yeah, and there's also opportunities for, um, now you have opportunities for air to actually reach your tree roots, which is better for your trees and you're not suffocating your, your large trees that you're trying to put on site. Um, because typically if you were to just put concrete and the tree roots grow underneath of the concrete, you see that sidewalk upheaval that comes from your roots trying to get air and trying to um, grow a little bit more. Uh, I will say that permeable pavement does require some maintenance. Um, there is no such thing as no maintenance, but we can do low maintenance. <laughs> and um, and the uh, permeable systems sometimes have to be vacuumed depending on the system, depending on where they are. Yep. Uh, and like Brian said, salt can often impact those systems a little bit. They can get clogged sometimes. But you know, with proper upkeep and, and care, just like anything, you can this can maintain and be a good solution for a long time. I think this is our last form of green infrastructure, which is green roofs. And these are pretty popular um, and can be a little bit more costly than your other forms of green infrastructure. You have to have the right sort of um, infrastructure for your building in order to support the weight of a green roof. But a green roof replaces traditional roofing with a vegetative roof system. Green roofs are designed so that rain is absorbed by the plants and other growing medium. And so you have a couple of different types of green roofs. You have intensive green roofs, which allow people to, uh, allow multiple activities on the roof. And then you have extensive green roofs, which are primarily just plants. Um, and typically they are a, um, What's the word I'm looking for? Um, they're kind of like a sheet. So typically you kind of roll it out and then the plants sort of start to populate and they're smaller plants that don't have very deep root systems and intensive green roofs have very deep root systems and can support things like trees or larger shrubs. Whereas extensive green roofs have um, support things like succulents and um, smaller uh, sh plant materials like what's the, uh, I'm losing track of my vocabulary today. It's the, uh, what are they called? Like the There's low like plants. plant and, oh, sedges? Ground, ground, ground covers. covers. That's yeah. what I was looking for. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah. um, so this picture you, you see here is the High Line in New York. So that's not in DC, but that's an example of an intensive green roof where it's elevated. It has several systems beneath of it. And you can see from this diagram, a green roof typically operates with several layers in between the vegetation layer and the actual roof of the building. Um, so you have, you, you have to have your growing medium or growing substrate, like your soil. You have to have a filtration sheet, a drainage layer, protection mat. You have to have all these things to make a green roof work effectively. And for every layer, there's going to be added weight. And so we have to, when we're engineering these things, we have to think about how much is this going to weigh. So not even just, not just thinking about the plants, but how much soil are these plants going to need? And that soil has weight. So that's something to consider with your green roofs. Um, that's sort of my last slide for the green infrastructure elements. And I can speak now to some of uh, how to sort of begin to mobilize your community around mm -hmm. green infrastructure. Um, or around uh, stormwater management systems and BMPs. Um, one thing I think is awareness that these things exist and awareness of certain programs that can help you implement things. So let's say, you know, you have your yard or you see your neighbor's yard and your neighbor's like, oh, I keep having all these flooding issues and all these things that are happening on my site. How do I get rid of this? How do I, you know, and, and it, instead of, you know, a typical response of, 
well, let's just fill it in or grade it or something like that. You can suggest things like, oh, have you thought about planting it? Have you thought about maybe how, um, have you just thought about our alternative ways of dealing with some of the issues that come onto your property? So I think building awareness and letting your neighbors know and letting your community know that there are multiple ways of addressing issues on your site other than like adding concrete or asphalt because that tends to be a lot of people's response. So that's one thing. The other thing I think would be to um, do demonstrations on your, on your property or in surrounding properties or point out demonstrations or definitely signage, uh, things that can showcase, okay, well, this is an operating system, right? It's not just your typical type of rain garden or um, system. And then I think in terms of getting a project done, you think through, can I pause you for guys a second? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of uh, getting a project completed, I think mobilizing your community and getting a group of people who are passionate about something together is a big part of it. And then understanding what your true objective is, right? So what is our actual objective? Is our objective more recreation space? Is our objective to manage the stormwater or to stop flooding? And once you figure out those things and who is participating in those processes, then you can sort of put together a plan of action like okay we can do an intervention at this phase at this phase at this phase and then um sometimes it comes down to funding maybe you don't have funding or maybe you need to find more resources to actually implement these things and that's where place um organizations like aws can really help you um the watershed stewards academy i'm sure has lots of resources one of my favorite groups is the Chesapeake Bay Trust. They're constantly giving out very small $5,000, you know, education or environmental restoration grants that can help support these efforts. So now you have finances that can support your project implementation, as well as programs like the River Smart Communities or River Smart Homes programs that give you rebates or um, discounts on certain elements for your site. So it's really about mobilizing coming up with an action plan, you know, figuring out where, what kind of resources you can get to help, and then you can move towards implementation. And I know I just made that sound like this really easy four-step process. It's not always going to be that easy. And sometimes it takes a little bit more legwork, but I mean, it's ultimately worth it in the end, because this is not just an asset for me, but an asset for my community. You know, like my aunt has a rain garden on her street, but her rain garden and her vegetable garden serves all the wildlife for her street that might be helping to pollinate other people's gardens and things like that. Or her stormwater is not no longer impeding on her neighbor's yard. And so they may seem like small interventions or small things, but small, a combination of lots of small interventions can have a huge impact. Absolutely, thank you so much, Kendra. And I think that that is the perfect segue um, into what we're gonna talk about next. I know that you have to leave us soon. Thank you so much for your time and we'll look forward to seeing you out in person someday very soon. Thanks, Kendra. Uh, thank you so much, Kendra. No problem, thank you all. Yeah. Take care. Brian and I are gonna get you oriented for um, what you need to know for Tuesday's class. So really quickly, let's see if I can pull this up. Um, I'm gonna show you the link that you'll need in order to sign up for Tuesday's class. Share screen. All right, so for our green infrastructure walking tour, um, which is what we're gonna do next Tuesday. So this is the one Tuesday that's the exception to our Tuesdays on Zoom rule. This one, you really just have to be there to understand it. So we're gonna do it in person. Um, you will need to sign up online. This is the registration form. I'm gonna email this to you. Um, it's a, about a one, a one mile walk from different metro stations to the first 
uh, location, which is on St. Paul's Rock Creek Church property. Um, I'm um, really quickly, just a couple of notes. Um, of course, you're going to need your mask. We're going to be practicing distancing. Um, you should have walking shoes and be prepared to walk outdoors. Um, so dress for the weather um, and come with a great attitude. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Brian to talk a little bit about what the sites are that we're gonna go and see. Okay, so we're gonna go to a few sites on Tuesday. Um, we're gonna start at uh, St. Paul's Rock Creek Cemetery where we have uh, three rain garden projects that we'll look at. Um, there's also a ton of trees there and we can talk a little bit about the importance of native trees um, and take a walk around there. It's a beautiful site. Um, and then we're going to walk over to St. Gabriel's uh, Catholic Church, um, which is at Grant Circle, um, and that, where there are there's a, a rain garden there. There's also a little bit of a, a different type of BMP. It's it's a rain garden, but it's in a, a container. Um, it's basically a um, a box rain garden, um, so a little bit different, and um, it'll be. A, an interesting conversation because we'll, it, it works it well with um, this idea of, of really constrained sites um, and how to fit a lot of um, of treatment um, into a small area. Um, and that site also has uh, several rain barrels or cisterns um, that we'll look at and we can talk a little bit about um, how those are constructed and, and, um, and then we'll walk over to um, one or two other sites and try to look at some permeable pavers. Um, but uh, today I'm going to share with you a little bit about uh, St. Gabriel's just to, to prime everyone for uh, for that visit. Um, so like I said, there are uh, there's a rain garden project there and there's also um, this uh, this box uh, rain garden project there. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, if I can find it. Okay, so, so first I'll, I'll just share a little bit about the site um, and talk a little bit about how we approached um, the you know approached the the site and what we looked for when we were trying to decide what to do and what the best opportunity for stormwater capture uh, was and so this is a river smart communities project um, the the whole uh, river smart is a is a um, district uh, department of environment and an energy uh, program um, which is all about trying to treat stormwater to meet um, meet our stormwater permit requirements um, for the city. Um, and there are several River Smart programs. There's River Smart Homes, uh, where folks are putting uh, rain barrels and small rain garden projects at their houses. Uh, there's River Smart Schools, which are, is all about doing BMPs at schools and, and bringing an education component into that. And then uh, there's River Smart uh, Communities, um, which which this uh, you know St. Gabriel's was a participant in. Um, this was back in 2019, um, and the purpose of River Smart Communities um, is not only to to create BMP projects that deal with that stormwater, but all to but to do it in a demonstrable way, to do it in a way that engages the the parishioners at um, whatever house of worship are, are participating in the, in the program, but also, you know, the, the broader community in that area. Um, so we want to do uh, stormwater projects that are really visible, um, that really show how the project works. So signage is usually involved, um, and, and we really want to pick a location uh, that, that gets a lot of foot traffic and that people can see. So here we're at um at saint gabriel's um it's a larger site because it includes uh, the church here as well as some smaller uh chapel buildings and also a school um so the first thing that we're looking at um when we when we visit a site um is is where stormwater is a, is occurring and and accumulating um so it's 
it's a very similar logic to identifying a watershed. Um, you're looking for the, the large areas where water is hitting the surface and then the path that it's taking um, and, and where it's accumulating. Um, so, uh, you know, you can see pretty quickly with a site like this that your big culprits are the large roofs. Um, so we have the, the large pitch roofs of, of the church here. We have the large flat roof of the school. Um, and then we're also seeing big parking lots. Um, so with the project that we'll talk about today, um, we were looking at this parking lot um, because, so you can't tell from, from uh, Google, but the, the parking lot was primarily pitching towards the school. Um, and, and all of this area, you know, 80% of the whole parking lot was pitching towards this green space here, the small strip of grass um, where there's a small storm inlet. Um, and so that was kind of the, the, the pattern of, of uh, drainage that was occurring. And, uh, and we saw a big opportunity to, to treat that water. Um, so we decided to have an intervention um, in this green space and try to put in some sort of BMP. So I'll now show the, some of the drawings. And again, this is the a site that we'll be looking at on Tuesday. So if any of it, this is unclear, this is just about priming you. If any of this is unclear, we'll, we'll be able to talk about it in more detail when we're on the site. Okay. All right. So here we are. Um, Raina, can you see the PDF now? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So here's that large parking lot that we were just looking at. Here is the edge of the school building. And here where there's this hatched area is that green space. And so all of you can see from this diagram, this hatched area is all of that impervious surface. In this case, it was asphalt where water was hitting this area and it was then flowing towards this grass. So there was just a slight, mm -hmm. sl a slight um, pitch uh, to the parking lot. And, and that was done intentionally. It was so that the water could accumulate into this grass area and then flow into this storm drain. Um, you know, it was that tends to be the case that there is there is intention it's um, to get the water into the storm system um, but as we've talked about you know we want to have the opportunity to slow that water down to capture and treat some of it um, and and to prevent so much of it from entering the storm system um, you know this site is within the uh, the combined sewer of uh, overflow system. Um, so in really heavy rain events, all this water is contributing to, um, to the big overflows that, that cause uh, sewage to enter into the, the Anacostia Potomac rivers. Um, and we wanted to, to take this water out of that equation. Um, so what we decided to do was put a uh, container decided to do was to construct this uh, rain garden box. Um, and essentially uh, the way it worked, originally the, the lawn was at the sidewalk level here, um, but we constructed these walls to basically make a bathtub. Um, different from a bathtub, um, we have plants in here to soak up that water um, and then we had, but, but similar again to the bathtub, we had an overflow system um, in case, you know, in the event that you have three inches of, of rain in a day, um, the water wouldn't just spill over this wall. So you can't see it, but right here, um, beyond these beautiful black-eyed Susans, there's a, a cut 
in the wall. Um, and, and that um, is, is basically a, an overflow for when water rises to a certain point, it drops through that cut um, and into that existing storm drain that we, we looked at earlier. Um, but this is pretty simple. You basically just where you have water um, from the parking lot that flows through the cuts here enters into the, the rain garden. We have these stones here, which help to dissipate the flow of the water. Um, in a really heavy rain event, you don't wanna have um, that high velocity of water uh, wash out the plants. So you, you put some stones there to break that up, slow it down um, so that you don't have that, that high water pressure. Um, and then we filled it with uh, native plants. Um, there are a mix of, of grasses and perennials. Um, we, we chose those in particular as opposed to shrubs because um, shrubs, there, there is an underdrain and we didn't want the, the um, more, um, you know, the woody roots of the shrub to, to penetrate into the, the underdrain and break up that, that PVC pipe. So we picked softer plants with more fibrous roots, but really deep water loving roots. Um, these are plants that can handle those, those extremes of standing water, but also of drought. Um, and so you have the, the function of the plants drinking up that water and also the, the high um, reservoir that volume um, so that water can sit in this thing and, and um, isn't just rushing right into uh, the storm system. There are a couple of other benefits for this project. You have a nice seating wall, you know, right, right to the left of the, uh, of the image here is the school. Um, so, st and, and just to the right of us is the front door to that school. So you st when students walk out, they can come and sit on the wall and read the sign and learn about how the project um, works so that you have that added benefit of demonstration. Um, and we'll look at this on Tuesday, but there's a drawing here that shows the different layers uh, that you can't see. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the magic of bioretention is happening below the surface. Um, so we want people to be able to see what is happening um, underneath that soil layer. Um, yeah, that's... Yeah, that sounds great. great. Yeah. Well, I know I'm definitely excited for our walk on Tuesday. I think it's gonna be a great time. Yeah, me too.